Bitcoin was the best performing asset in Q1, but let's take a look at what's next for the crypto industry this quarter. I'm joined by Head of Research, Matt. Maybe we could get into what's exciting you in the market and what you're looking forward to and following this quarter. Yeah, sure, Nick. It's going to be a tough quarter to top after what was, yeah, extremely sort of positive start to the year for the crypto market. Wanting to try it, let's get through five. I reckon we can get through five today of Q2. We had other ideas, but I think five we, we can limit ourselves to because there's a lot going on. Let's go with number one. First thing I'm probably looking forward to the most is the most obvious and it's the most soon is going to be ETH withdrawals. That'll be coming out about at the time of the release of this video. And really, honestly, just looking forward to it being done. It was the similar feeling I got to the merge. It was excitement leading up up to it but then actually by the time it arrived i was like i'm kind of getting sick of talking about this <laughs> so you know fingers crossed it all goes smoothly testing has been all smooth and successful and really what's the price impact going to be i've come to the conclusion after we've been talking about this i feel like for about six months now i've been reading different conversations about it as well ultimately i don't think the price is i'm going to go out there and say the price is going to be basically unaffected i think there's strong cases that the price will rip higher the there's strong cases why the price will plummet after the withdrawals in the short term. But medium to long term, it's a positive for Ethereum. We need e withdrawals enabled in order for obviously like the merge and proof of stake essentially to be finished. So that's my sort of Q2 that's leading leading the way in terms of, you know, out of the five things that we think are probably the top five things to watch. Yeah, I'm with you there. Um, we've also got a video on ETH withdrawals dissecting exactly what we think is going to happen with the price. I'm with you too. I think that it's just going to be a de-risking of ETH and it's going to promote more adoption and certainty with ETH, which I'm really excited about. Uh, maybe we can jump into number two. I've got here staking uh, services upgrades especially liquid snake and maybe get into that. Yeah, yeah. This is um, an exciting one that we've we've covered. Nick, I think I had it in my sort of 2023 preview video and, and post for sort of collective ship members. Um, liquid staking is really as I saw sort of predicted, catching a really, you know, the narrative and really gaining some momentum in this in the first quarter. And I think that will continue this quarter. A major reason for that obviously is the enabling of with withdrawals. So you'll have people able to shuffle around their stake, their staked ETH going to different liquid staking protocols. Um, and then sort of secondly, a reason why I think that momentum will continue is because really all the majors or liquid staking protocols are getting major upgrades in this quarter. So we've got Lido will be bringing out Lido V2. Um, so really high level, it's just modularizing the, the architecture of the protocol, really just making it possible, more flexible, like ways where validators can come in and you know participate in Lido, uh, where right now it's pretty limited and centralized. That's really just a high level explanation of what V2 offers. That's probably going to come out later in Q2. Uh, we got Rocket Pool, probably the second biggest sort of liquid staking or, you know, one of the top ones, at least behind Lido. Uh, they're bringing out their Atlas upgrade, which is probably going to come out. Yeah, it will be coming out from what I've been seeing sooner than Lido V2 um, and, and not too long, in fact, after the enabling of withdrawals for Ethereum mainnet. Um, that will sort of just, you know, bring more capital efficiency to Rocket Pool, making it more accessible for people who, you know, don't necessarily have that much ETH. Like they definitely don't have 32 ETH to run a, you know, a full validator, but, you know, they might have, you know, eight, eight ETH worth and then they put down a bit of RPL token as well in order to start running a mini pool on Rocket Pool. So, Ultimately, takeaway there, it's going to just be a lot more accessible uh, to just people wanting to, you know, earn rewards for staking ETH and helping ultimately secure the Ethereum blockchain. I'll just get through the final one as well, Nick, uh, with StakeWise. That's probably a relatively small liquid staking protocol. They have been around a while now, um, but they are sort of getting their big upgrade as well. You know, in the in the coming months still, I think, It'll probably be around the time of Lido V2, maybe maybe a tiny bit later. Uh, they had a big presence at ETH Denver, probably one of Ethereum, the ecosystem and community's probably biggest annual events. Um, Stakewise V3, again, that same sort of story of just making it more accessible, easier to use. Um, and I expect to see 
like a, a big sort of end of Q2 and even Q3 for stake wise. Yeah, I'm surprised looking at the ETH2 liquid staking balances actually that stake wise only has 1% market share. Mm-hmm. It shows you maybe sure that I'm expecting uh, a great shift in you know the balances and where the ETH is in these staking pools. At the moment, LIGO, maybe we can get the uh, table put up on the screen here, but it mm-hmm. looks like they've got uh, Lido has 75% pretty much. So they've got commanding lead. Next best is coin cases and then rocket pool. So ma- massive, I think, opportunity for these staking pools to be more widely uh, more widely used and maybe we're going to see a great shift. That's what I'm sort of anticipating and keen to see if that plays out. Maybe looking outside of Ethereum, Matt, uh, what's interesting you outside of Ethereum for Q for Q2? Outside of Ethereum, um, you know, I think the rivals, we've really got to look at the rivals and the competitors for Ethereum. Um, you know, we talk a lot about Bitcoin, but probably aside aside from Bitcoin, we're looking at the smart contract sort of blockchains. So your mind would go to Solana, Avalanche, I think is still, I think it's still like worth monitoring. I keep telling Collective Shift members not to write them off. Uh, they really struggled at the end of last year. Um, and even in Q1, they had sort of performance you know, issues from time to time. Solana went down again for, you know, they've gone down basically a handful of times over the past like two years. Avalanche had some sort of issues uh, in late March, which it sort of patched and were relatively minor. Obviously, it's never good when a blockchain can't be used. Um, but, you know, it was a pretty quick outage, all things considered. Um, Aval- so really, probably my Q2, to put it in sort of a nutshell, for those ones that are those Ethereum competitors, um, the Q2, I would really be, really just be honestly, just monitoring uptime. Like if, if those two blockchains in particular can go through all of Q2 without any period of degraded performance and like really slow transactions per second, you know, if, if both of them can go through unscathed, that would be very positive, um, in my opinion. Um, and just in terms of probably Avalanche in particular, that's when I think he's going to sort of gain a lot of just attention or renewed interest in Q2. I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes out of their sort of big conference in early May in Barcelona. It's a three day conference, a lot of speakers, a lot of press I'm expecting. And, you know, I would be pretty shocked if there just isn't really any big news that comes out of that. And I'd probably be a bit more bearish if that is the case. But at this stage, I'm, I would expect to see sort of some big announcements, maybe some more grants, things like that to be sort of announced at that sort of avalanche summit coming up at the start of May. Yeah. Uh, flicking back to Solana there, that's one that I'm also watching quite closely. One thing that I think is maybe being under appreciated by the market and maybe what jump crypto are building they're building a uh, second and third validator client for solana uh to put in perspective ethereum has many different clients that can be used uh the more clients you have the more resiliency you have because if one goes down uh, then that creates massive issue because there's no redundancy so they're building uh, just basically more core infrastructure for solana and building this, this new validator client so it's the hopes that Fire Dancer can help increase things like its networking throughput, its efficiency, and overall, it's just hardening and resiliency of the network. So keen to see if we see a rollout begin in Q2, but certainly uh, later in the year, this is something I think uh, worth paying attention to. Uh, maybe bringing it back to Ethereum, maybe jump the gun there, but one final Ethereum thing I think we're both looking at is Arbitrum activity and what's going on with potential airdrop farmers and where the real usage uh, is for these scaling networks. Yeah, for sure, Nick. I think we've got the layer ones covered and now sort of Q2, it's all, it's time for the L2s. I think (laughs) they're going to take more, just more like traction, more usage. Um, And it's a really exciting time for Ethereum. The extent to which they grow will hinge a lot, honestly, I think, on Arbitrum. Why is that the case? I think where the rubber's going to sort of hit the road. We're going to get a lot more clarity on 
how much demand is there for this thing, like in terms of using it? Um, why are we talking about this? Well, yes, activity had been going really well, Q4 last year, Q1 this year, but that was what is known as airdrop farming. So essentially just people using the network in anticipation of an eventual token that would be announced by Arbitrum, which they did in March and it launched in March. Um, so, you know, people sort of, you know, farming. So just sort of using the network, hoping that they'll eventually get a token, which they did. What we're really going to see now will be pretty telling and very indicative of true demand for layer two solutions. We'll honestly just be tracking the activity of Arbitrum in Q2. So what, what you typically see when a token launches and, and, the, and with airdrop farmers, they will typically just close their positions and like withdraw everything from a given app or a given protocol and they'll move on to the next one. ZK Sync is one that they've all sort of flocked to next. Mm. So for Arbitrum, it's going to be, you know, imperative to see, you know, really if that, if that activity sort of persists, um, if it declines, how much will it decline by? I'd be extremely impressed if it actually increases in Q2. Um, so that's going to be, yeah, really important to, to sort of to monitor and it'll be indicative of just, the layer two sort of just demand for layer twos in general. Yeah, I've spoken about that as well. The concern and tough, um, the difficulty that is for us as analysts to try and gauge real demand when you have these incentives that are all over the place and incentivizing fake usage of chains, which makes it really difficult to judge. Hey, how many people are actually benefiting and using this thing as intended? So that's one, one I'm keen to. And there's a great chart. Uh, to check out that shows after the Arbitrum airdrop, the uh, bridging to layer, layer two networks like Starknet or ZK Sync, who do not have a token yet, went vertical, basically. <laughs> see the incentive there and really keen to see which one has the main usage. Uh, now, maybe looking outside of cryptocurrency, uh, crypto native platforms into the centralized exchanges, Binance is one that I think deserves the fifth, the fifth and final slot here. We saw civil charges and a very heavy handed, uh, outline report put by the CFTC, which is the futures trading commission in the U S. Uh, it was quite strong language and a lot of people have suspected, you know, that there is more of these charges to come from potentially the DOJ, from the SEC from the other US authorities. Uh, do you share a similar sentiment? Because to me, that's one that I'm very concerned about is what happens if Binance is charged to a greater extent than just civil charges. Yeah, absolutely, Nick. I think Q2, yeah, that will really sort of shape the success of Q2. And I think the the, the inclusion of a really negative Binance news or the omission and so nothing happening in other words, I think will really dictate the performance of the market. You know, we saw after that CFTC sort of complaint was filed, uh, we saw, you know, BTC and ETH like plummeted, you know, I think 15 minutes, I had it written down in my sort of post for members after 15 minutes of that filing, you know, BTC and ETH had both just plummeted down like 3%. Um, and and B, BNB was, um, you know, down by 4 or 5% just like very quickly after. So just a signal, another reminder of how fundamental news can, can impact, you know, crypto prices. Um, but in terms of what happens next, I think, yes, the CFTC's filing was unusually detailed. Um, I've heard that, you know, the commodities regulated never really goes into that much detail. Um, when they are laying out their allegations, um, you know, things like, you know, counter terrorism sort of, mm -hmm. you know, concerns were sort of like really detailed they had like you know access to the ceo's phone and, and like sort of published messages um you know on there which were sort of inferred to be from the ceo um and yeah i think this is all sort of like why would they go to that much effort maybe they're just very diligent but maybe also they are working in collaboration with other agencies which is pretty typical and pretty common in the u.s we know the DOJ has been investigating Binance for several years now. So, you know, I think they've sort of probably gathered all the evidence that they need, whether or not they go ahead. Um, look, 
it, it's hard to tell without knowing all the facts, but like, I'd be pretty surprised if, if nothing, if nothing else happened and it was just the CFTC that went after Binance, mm. put it that way. That would like surprise me if, if it was just limited to that court battle or that legal battle. Um, so that would have the potential, you know, to really drag on markets if maybe some more criminal sort of allegations came for Binance from in particular the Department of Justice. Um, so yeah, Q2, that will definitely be dominating the headlines. And yeah, I think I'm not sure if you had any more thoughts on that, Nick, but, um, I'll just get up my post here for members that we did cover recently. Using thoughts there is that I don't think it is too wild to assume, uh, greater charges will happen because one of the main things that came out in that CFTC filing for members was the mention of terrorism organizations and Binance basically looking the other way to onboarding, transacting, and having you know, possible organizations of that magnitude transacting on their platform. So that's huge and high level accusations and possible impacts that it will have for Binance. And it's just more fuel to the fire that I think regulators will use. And it's gonna be really tough, I think, for Q2. It's, I'm expecting more of an onslaught of, of regulatory news as well, something we've been looking at. But there's a good saying that normally they laugh at you um, and then they fight you, which feels like we're in the fighting stage with a lot of uh, serious politicians coming out and taking a stance against crypto. Yeah, certainly. Uh, thanks for listening. And if anybody wants to get more of our insights at Collective Shift, the best way is to subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find at collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter.